coming up on this Tuesday edition of Daybreak. Unable to agree on when to restart operations at the Kaesong Industrial Complex, the two Korea's new management committee will try to narrow their differences ahead of a follow-up meeting next week. Lawmakers are expected to approve an arrest warrant for leftist Unified Progressive Party representative Lee Sok-ki as early as Wednesday. He is accused of conspiring to rebel against the government. First punitive military action against Syria could be on the horizon as France joins the US in concluding the Assad regime is the only likely perpetrator of last month's deadly chemical attack near Damascus. Daybreak begins now. You're watching Daybreak on Tuesday, September 3rd, and I'm Choi Yusan here in Seoul. Let's start this morning with the latest inter-Korean talks at the North Korean border town of Kaesong. At the inaugural meeting of the Joint Committee overseeing management of their shuttered Kaesong factory park, the two Koreas fell short of setting a date to resume business operations, only agreeing to continue negotiations in the coming days. Our Oh jin has the details. The two Koreas on Monday have failed to agree on when to resume operations at the Kaesong Industrial Complex in their first meeting of a joint committee set up for better management of the business park. Instead, the two sides decided to hold the committee's second meeting next Tuesday on the 10th to settle a date to resume business at the complex. The issue is what dragged the meeting out, which lasted for more than 12 hours. While the North wants business at the park to restart as soon as possible, South Korea has taken a rather cautious stance. A government official in Seoul explained that the South Korean government wants to set up regulatory measures and restore the military hotline in the West Sea before the resumption of operations to prevent another abrupt shutdown of the complex in the future. The two Koreas promised to carry on with discussions within the four divisions set up under the committee before the next committee meeting to come up with ways to strengthen business regulations and normalize the complex. The divisions of investment protection and global competitiveness are scheduled to meet on Wednesday, while the divisions in charge of the entry and exit of South Korean workers and communications will meet on Thursday. Experts predict should talks within these divisions go well, the two Koreas will likely be able to agree on a specific day to restart operations at the park in their next committee meeting. The two sides will also continue negotiations on how to compensate the losses of South Korean companies during the sudden closure of the complex earlier this year. Oh jin Arirang News. With the outlook for inter-Korean relations looking up, officials from China and North Korea recently discussed reopening the long-stalled six-party talks. A Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson said during a regular briefing on Monday that China's top nuclear envoy, Wu Dawei, exchanged views on the current state of affairs on the Korean peninsula, as well as a resumption of the multilateral denuclearization talks. Beijing, however, didn't elaborate on Pyongyang's stance on the matter. Wu visited Pyongyang for a five-day visit last week and met with several high-ranking North Korean officials, including the North's first vice foreign minister and point man on nuclear issues, Kim ge -gwan. Over now to the latest on the probe into an alleged revolt plot here in the South. The National Assembly has begun deliberation procedures over the arrest of leftist lawmaker Lee Seok-ki, who is accused of planning to topple the government. Our Han Daun has more on the vote expected to take place on Wednesday and on whether to give prosecutors the green light to arrest E. The ongoing criminal probe surrounding leftist lawmaker Lee Seok-ki took center stage on the opening day of the National Assembly's 100-day regular session. During the first plenary session on Monday, lawmakers read a bill requesting approval for Lee's arrest and officially launched deliberation procedures over the matter. 
Yi, a member of the Unified Progressive Party and allegedly pro-North Korea, has thrown Korea's political arena into a new turmoil for allegedly plotting to stage a rebellion against the current government. According to current law, a bill can be put to a vote between 24 and 72 hours after being read at a plenary session. Both the ruling and opposition parties look set to hold the vote on Wednesday after spending Tuesday holding internal discussions. But with the main opposition Democratic Party reportedly agreeing to go along with the arrest bill, it is highly likely to gain parliamentary approval. If the bill does pass, it will be submitted to the court after being reviewed by the Justice Ministry and the Prosecutor's Office. The far-left lawmaker has been accused of conspiring with members of a secret organization called the Revolutionary Organization, or RO, in May to blow up major infrastructure in the nation, such as communication centers and oil storage tanks, police stations and armories. A tape recording obtained by the nation's spy agency reportedly has E and RO members discussing detailed ways to sabotage the South Korean government and U.S. troops in the event of an inter-Korean war. E still denies the charges against him. And then, Arirang News. Former Korean President Noh Tae-woo is expected to completely pay off his fine for corruption charges by Wednesday. Noh's former in-law Shin Myung-soo returned 800 million won, or about 730,000 U.S. dollars, to the state coffers on Monday afternoon. Noh's brother Tae-woo will pay the remaining 13 million dollars Wednesday, completing the former president's payoff that took a total of 16 years. No Tae-woo, who led the country from 1988 to 1993, insisted the two shoulder the bill since he had entrusted them with his slush funds. Another former president, Chun Doo-hwan, has also long been under suspicion of having his family members help him hide millions of dollars in slush funds. A team of prosecutors on Monday raided a Seoul-based flour milling company owned by one of Chun's in-laws on suspicion it was used to launder the former president's secret funds. Moving now to the government's efforts to support real estate transactions. The Ministry of Land, Infrastructure and Transport has announced plans to inject around 7.2 billion U.S. dollars this year to support 120,000 households that are trying to buy or rent new homes. The move is part of government measures unveiled last week to lessen the financial burden on low- and middle-income households. The ministry says people hoping to move into new homes will be able to secure loans with lower interest rates starting next Monday. A new type of transit card will be released in November that can be used for nearly every mode of public transportation in most regions. Korea's transport ministry said on Monday that the new card will work on railway trains, subways and intra-city buses in more than 16 different municipal regions. That means cardholders will be able to visit almost any part of the country with a swipe of a single prepaid card. The ministry added it plans to expand the services by next year to include more areas and other transportation methods, including public parking lots. Despite fears local fishery products may have been tainted by radiation from Japan, the Korean government says there's nothing to worry about. Rakani Lee has more on the nation's continuous monitoring of Japanese marine products. The Korean government is trying to reassure the public that imported fishery products from Japan are indeed safe, despite the radiation leak. Since 2011 until now, out of the 66,000-plus imported fishery products from Japan, none of them have exceeded the maximum legal limit of radiation of 100 becquerel per kilogram. Still, the government is taking extra measures to prevent any contaminated products by the Fukushima nuclear plant leak from entering the local market. On Monday, Korea's Ministry of Food and Drug Safety announced that it is thoroughly monitoring fish at local markets and increasing the frequency of radiation checks. The ministry says that health officials will make regular visits to Seoul's Nurangjin fish market, one of the largest markets in Korea, 
and to a warehouse of frozen fish products in Incheon. Inspectors are also cracking down on labels of all fishery products to make sure they clearly state the origin of products. The ministry adds that it will continue to inform the public on the results of the inspections. And looking forward, the inspection results on all imported fishery products from Japan will be made public every day to ease public concerns. The results of the radiation checks were first posted just once a week, but now will be available daily on the ministry's homepage. Connie Lee, Arirang News. If you want the latest news from Korea and around the world, okay, to return to the negotiation. President Park Geun Hye planned, given the current circumstances. On your way to work or at home, ministry. the legislature will convene a. Tune into Daybreak on Arirang TV. France has followed the United States in saying it has proof the Syrian government was behind last month's devastating chemical weapons attack that killed hundreds of civilians. A nine-page report, which was drafted by French intelligence services, was shown to French ministers and heads of parliamentary groups at an emergency meeting on Syria on Monday. The report says Syrian President Bashar al-Assad personally ordered the, quote, massive and coordinated chemical attack. NATO Secretary General Anders Fogh Rasmussen also says he has seen evidence that has convinced him Syrian authorities used chemical weapons, adding it would send a dangerous signal to dictators if the world did not respond firmly. In opposition of military intervention, Russian President Vladimir Putin has proposed sending a group of lawmakers to the U.S. to discuss the situation with members of Congress who are set to vote next week on whether to authorize airstrikes against Syria. A strong tornado ripped through eastern Japan on Monday, injuring several dozens of people, destroying buildings and uprooting trees. Local authorities say at least 67 people were wounded in northern city of Koshigaya alone. Footage aired by state-run broadcaster NHK showed homes destroyed, schools with shattered windows and damaged cars. Power supply was cut in some 30,000 households in the worsted areas. The local fire department says it has prepared evacuation shelters and emergency supplies. In what is considered one of the largest corporate transactions in history, Britain's Vodafone has sold its 45% share in Verizon Wireless, giving the U.S. telecom giant Verizon Communications complete control over the mobile network operator. With the $130 billion U.S. dollars it will make from the sell-off, Vodafone plans to return some 40 percent to shareholders and direct a portion towards its high-speed mobile phone networks. Some $9 billion will be used for the 4G network development plan called the Project Spring. Vodafone also aims to expand its reach in the European market. The Korean government recently announced that a substitute holiday system will go into effect later this year for all government agencies. Despite opposition from business groups, public opinion is strongly in favor of the extra holidays. Economic research shows it will also provide a boost to the nation's tourism industry. Our Polly reports. The substitute holiday system has been a controversial issue among Korean lawmakers since its proposal nearly four years ago by the Culture and Tourism Ministry. Substitute holidays provide an extra day off for workers when a holiday falls on a weekend. The majority of citizens, however, say that substitute holidays are long overdue in Korea's overworked society. A national survey by the Korea Culture and Tourism Institute found that over half of respondents were in favor of the extra holiday system due to a lack of time off for leisure activities. That sentiment was followed by those stating health problems and economic reasons to implement the standard. Private research firms are also in agreement. A public survey by the Hyundai Research Institute showed that 70 percent of respondents said they would take advantage of the extra days off to go on vacation within Korea. In addition, the institute says the economic impacts of the substitute holiday system would be considerable. 
The average of three extra days off a year would translate to approximately 2.1 billion U.S. dollars in domestic travel and leisure spending. The Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism has strongly promoted substitute holidays as a way to stimulate the economy and job creation, as well as improve the standard of living in Korea. If we intend to further develop and create a more advanced society, we must share a greater recognition for leisure and cultural values. If we are able to reach that point, then I think we'll be able to achieve that development of our society. Business circles are opposed to substitute holidays, citing lower productivity and growing financial burdens. But how much more can we ask from the nation's workforce? People in Korea already work nearly 300 more hours per year, compared to their average counterparts in the OECD. Paul Yi, Arirang News. It's not every day that young, promising conductors are given the reins to the Seoul Philharmonic Orchestra, but that's precisely what happened for six individuals recently. They also got a chance to learn from one of the best conductors in the world, Maestro Chung Myung Hoon. A culture correspondent, Park Ji Wan, tells us more. 33-year-old Choi soo is one of Korea's most promising young conductors as proven through world competitions over the past few years. Now he's conducting Brahms Symphony No. 1 with members of the Seoul Philharmonic Orchestra. This is part of a conducting master class offered by Maestro Jang Myung Hoon and Che, who is one of the six conductors selected. Of course, there must have been parts where it wasn't good enough. But I tried my best for the given 30 minutes to deliver the essence of Brahms that I interpreted. It wasn't just aspiring Korean conductors taking part. One international participant also got a chance to learn from Maestro Chang. I have heard this orchestra in a couple concerts before, and I'm very looking forward to work with them before I came all the way to Korea. And of course, we've uh, had a chance to meet uh, Maestro, and it's a great honor because I heard a lot about him. I've seen many of his concerts, um, but it's my first time I actually get to meet him. The six participating conductors, all in their early to mid-30s, were recommended and selected because of their outstanding talents. However, from the perspective of Maestro Chang, they all have room to improve. From postures to the mindset of approaching the music, the 60-year-old shared his wisdom and personal anecdotes about how to draw the best sound by gathering the force of the orchestra. What we are trying to do is help uh, the younger ones have more opportunities to show themselves, uh, which is the main difficulty for young, young conductors, that they do not have enough occasion to conduct the orchestra and to show what they can do. Uh, so that is the main purpose of, of this uh, master class and the project in the future. This master class is part of the Seoul Philharmonic Orchestra's long-term project to nurture the musical talents of the next generation. The orchestra plans to continue trying to identify and nurture young talents over the course of next 10 years. Park Ji Won, Arirang News. And a good Tuesday morning to you all. Now it's September 3rd here in the nation, which means we have exactly one month until the regular season, the KBO, comes to an end. So every game is important for the nine teams minus the Hanwai Eagles. Let's take a look at the standings so far in the league. Of course, taking a look at the standings here. First off and first place once again are the Samsung Lions, who barely had the first place lead now with the LG Twins right behind them in second, but with zero games back. 
Hockey. Tucson Bears sneaking behind the two teams at three and a half games behind in third place, with the Nexon Heroes bouncing back just four and a half games back. And now over at the bottom half of the league, the Lotte Giants still trying to climb up to fourth place, but trail Nexon by three and a half games. The SK Wyverns right behind them as well in sixth place with the Kia Tigers now barely holding on to their seventh place spot with the NC Dinos trying to catch up to the Kia Tigers. And of course the Hanwha Eagles being the Hanwha Eagles sit comfortably in ninth place. And state of baseball, but over in the majors where Choo Choo Train Chu Shin Su has been absolutely on fire as of late. Now, in yesterday's game against the Colorado Rockies, Chu Shin Su goes three for five with a home run, his 18th of the season. And then earlier today, the Cincinnati Red Slugger goes yard once again, a two run shot in the second inning, his 19th of the season as he nears another 2020 season. And now moving on to archery, it's no secret that the Korean archers are the best in the world. And it doesn't take a world record performance to know that, or does it? London Olympic gold medalist Oh Jin Hyuk taking part in a domestic competition yesterday goes 36 for 36 on the bullseye, tying the world record with 360 points. Of the 36 shots, 20 of them were shot dead center, proving once again that he is the world's best male archer. Also helps that his girlfriend is the world's number one female archer, Kibo Bae. And moving on to basketball, where the recent success of some of the university players in the nation started to gather more popularity in college basketball here in the country. And with the playoffs taking place, Hanyang University beat Kungguk University in a close one, 74 to 71, with Korea University dominating Sangmyung University 97 to 68. And later tonight, the second game will take place between the four universities. And moving on to football with the transfer window just about done. There's a mystery over in the EPL. Korea's Chitong won headed to Hamburg SV in Germany's Bundesliga, or is he? While well, sources reported that Sunderland and Hamburg have agreed to a full transfer worth 4 million pounds or roughly 6.2 million US dollars, the striker himself denied those reports, stating that he has no idea what they're talking about. While no one's sure where he'll be, one thing's for sure, he's in Korea at the moment preparing for the upcoming match against Haiti. And speaking of transfers, here's another major transfer. After Gareth Bale signed with Real Madrid, looks like the Spanish Giants needed some money as they sold a big name to Arsenal. The English side, who's notorious for not spending the big money, have agreed to buy Mesut Wezel from Real Madrid, a deal that is said to be worth 42.4 million pounds or roughly 65.7 million U.S. dollars. The 24-year-old has agreed to personal terms but must have a medical before Arsenal can confirm the signing. And with that said, that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Happy Tuesday morning to you. I'm Lee Ji-hyun with your latest weather forecast. Well, don't you think yesterday weather conditions featured near perfect early fall weather? Well, I hope you enjoyed it because today we're going to have a similar weather condition as yesterday. Clear and sunny skies with daytime highs hiking up to upper 20s. So yes, mild afternoon highs aren't in a hurry to leave for a while. But there's a chance of spotty showers in Gangwon province in the afternoon, so please keep that in mind. Well, right now we're looking at clear skies for central regions but lots of clouds have rolled in for southern provinces but it should gradually uh, clear up towards the afternoon and there's a tropical storm Toraj developed near Taiwan and it's heading to Japan at the moment and we're looking at about 20% of possibility that South Korea might get affected by Toraj on this Friday but I'll be sure to give you an update on that now tomorrow's weather will be a repeat of today's condition clouds will increase during the day but we should end up with a fair amount of sunshine overall with warmer afternoon
With that, let's take a look at today's readings. Now, uh, morning lows are even lower than yesterday, if you have noticed. Uh, so we'll start off at 17 degrees, but we'll rise to 28 degrees Celsius. That's 82 degrees in Fahrenheit. And it looks like Daegu, Gwangju will be 29 and 30, and it will reach for 27 for Busan with lots of sunshine. Now let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like Jeju and Daejeon will be in the upper 20s, while Tokyo and Mount Kumgang remains in the low 20s. Now that's all for Korea, and here's the global forecast for our viewers around the world. That's all I have for you at this hour. Enjoy your morning commute and have a wonderful day. Now back to you, son, in the studio. Thank you, Jiyeon. And those are the stories we have for you at this hour. Thank you for being with us.